So today what we're talking about is how to do SEO for artificial intelligence uh, using user intent optimization and user experience optimization. So we're pretty much just going to dive right into it. First of all, we're going to cover why. Why do we care about this? So algorithms are becoming more and more advanced and we have to constantly figure out new ways to optimize for them. Google's introducing rank brain, Facebook has over 100,000 different ranking factors, and so on and so on. So we're going to be talking about how to basically go about optimizing for these different platforms. But before we talk about it, uh, just a little bit about me for those of you who don't know, which most of you probably know who I am. Uh, so I got started in SEO by ranking number one for uh, SEO in my town. I got hired by an agency in the town that I'm in and I gave them back their rankings. I worked there for a year and then I left and now I do mainly SEO videos, courses, stuff like that. Um, when I first left, I was living in this little garage, working about five to seven hours, uh, sorry, longer than that. I was working for like 12 hours a day, but I was doing like five to seven hour long videos every day. So some unique things about me, I don't do link building. Uh, I was able to achieve uh, around three or four months ago, having the most five star reviews as an SEO on Google. Uh, I have the most streamed SEO tutorials in the world on YouTube, yada, yada, uh, just some bragging rights so you guys can know that. Uh, you know, I somewhat know what I'm talking about when it comes to this stuff. So the techniques I'm about to show you brought me in clients results like this. So this is one of my clients. Uh, their name is our sleep guide. They do mattress reviews. When they first started, they had about zero uh, average monthly visitors. They actually had like 17. Uh, and now they're bringing in like 19 to 20,000 organic visits and they're bringing in about 16 to $18,000 ROI per month. So they're doing pretty well. Um, so you might be thinking though, that might not be that much traffic in comparison to what you've seen other SEOs do. So it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, uh, clients just care if they're going from point A where they're not making as much money to point B where they're making more. So this is with also zero link building. So it's a sustainable strategy, which is continuing to bring them more and more traffic and sales every month. So. As I said, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is are your clients happy and are they making money? And this one is. Cool. So first of all, why is SEO for artificial intelligence different? So AI has been uh, become extremely efficient at understanding two of the hottest growing metrics on the market, user intent and user experience, which is why we're going to be talking about user intent optimization, user experience optimization. So I'm going to show you some proof. If we take... Uh, some pages with high click-through rates, high relevancy signals, um, and look at where they're ranking. Generally, they're ranking very high. So if we look at you know something that's receiving a 72% click-through rate, generally they're going to be ranking very high for that keyword. And that's not even a branded keyword. That is a informational-based post that we made. Um, you can see all of over here. All of the other click-through rates they're receiving over here are, uh, as well are receiving uh, very high percentages. So that's why this page is generally over uh, all these different queries ranking very well, as you can see here on the site. Cool. So this is the uh, page that we're ranking. You can see here it is rsleepguide.com uh, slash puffy purple, whatever. I don't know why I'm saying the URL, but either way, you can see here they have aggregate rating from schema market, which improves click through rates. We have a ultimate comparison in 2018. So people are seeing uh, the ultimate comparison, which is what they're looking for, right? They're not looking for a partial comparison. And they're looking for something that's up to date and relevant to this date. Um, and they're also looking for all these main keywords. So this is optimized very well for click-through rates and same thing with the meta description. So let's look at some of the top platforms, different latest algorithms. So we got, like I said earlier, Google RankBrain. RankBrain is supposedly an upgraded self-learning artificial intelligence of Hummingbird, which was made to understand user intent based on semantic keywords. So if you're not familiar with Hummingbird, it's this algorithm that Google made a little, ba a little while ago to understand uh, the different types of searches that are being put into its algorithm, I mean, into its search bar. So like if somebody looks for place, uh, it could also mean restaurant. So if they type in pizza place, then Google's able to understand that it's a restaurant. Um, if they type in uh, place style, I guess 
there's a less relevance to uh, it being a restaurant. So it has these different, um, uh, I guess, ranking factors or you know percentage-based math uh, factors, base factors that are able to understand whether or not these things are correlating with a, another type of query within that search phrase. So that was kind of confusing, but you get the point. So uh, Rank Brains, apparently an upgraded version of Hummingbird, which does all of this, but also learns uh, on the fly. It's a, it, it has a built, built in self-learning artificial intelligence that you know, adds to these different factors. So in terms of Facebook artificial intelligence, there's supposedly over 100,000 different, uh, 100, different ranking factors. Um, so I can't tell you too much about those, but I can tell you about the core ranking signals of Facebook and YouTube. So Facebook uses something known as edge rank. Edge rank utilizes a technique called time decay, which relies on the last interaction times of the posts you engaged with. So some of you guys may notice that after you interact with a post on Facebook, you will see more posts of that type or mo more posts from a certain type of uh, person or page that you interacted with. The reason for that is uh, Facebook is able to understand what you like based on what you last interacted with. Now, say for instance, you don't interact with that same post for a while or that person, you stop seeing as much of that. So the whole basic principle of Facebook is it's trying to give you content based on what you engage with. YouTube is very similar. So YouTube uses average view duration, which is an engagement factor. So how often uh, or how much time you spend watching a video, uh, that's how that video ends up usually ranking because uh, or getting dispersed to other people. Because uh, YouTube is able to tell that that is a very high value signal. If you're watching a lot of the video and it is about a certain subject, then YouTube is obviously going to want to disperse it to more people. Um, user metrics also include click-through rates, how many people actually see your uh, you know, uh, video and then click through to it and then also stay on it. So the whole point, let me get a little bit of water. The whole point of behind these different algorithms is that content's growing really fast on the internet. And as content grows and expands and becomes um, more and more saturated, uh, these algorithms have to understand how to push the best content to its users because we only have so much time to consume all this content. We'll talk about that more in a little in a little bit. So, obviously, as people continue to push out content, interact with content, these platforms will continue to get more and more data about their users. So, Facebook and Google have huge user-based uh, data, and you know that's the kind of thing that's going to really improve their algorithms in the long run because. Uh, being able to use their user data to their own advantage to be able to serve the best content possible uh, is going to become, you know, they're going to become so much more efficient in the future that they will not need really basic algorithms. They're going to be ranking a lot of stuff, uh, probably based off their artificial intelligence. So as I said, it'll continue to feed their AIs. And a common trend we've been seeing over the last few years is user intent and user experience signals becoming easier to understand by search engines for the reason I just discussed. So let's talk about where the internet is headed in five years. There was a recent study just done where, um, I don't remember who it was, but uh, somebody was talking about how the internet five years from now will be five times what it is now. So let's just let that sink in. If we're already at information overload and the internet is going to be five times what it is now, uh, we're going to have a very hard time dispersing content. And I'm going to tell you how that's going to, how we're going to go about that and how to basically prepare for that as well. So most of this content will likely be video and more specific, specifically live video with live editing. So you might be wondering, what do you mean by live editing? So as you can see now, uh, well, this is going to be a pre-recorded video by the time you see this, but um, it, what you can actually do with these live videos is you can edit them in the uh, middle of a live stream. So if I was going live, I could actually add certain things to this. Like I could add uh, like a video pre-roll or I could add uh, you know, my face up in the corner and then take it away and then switch angles or whatever. 
the reason why live editing and live video is going to be so important is because you want to be able to make as much content with quality as possible in order to compete with the market demand. You're also going to want to try to keep that video as recent as possible because as uh, we get more and more people consuming content, they're going to want the most recent content possible because they're not going to have time to watch video or read a blog post from three weeks ago. Maybe they will for three weeks ago, but maybe not for you know a month or five months or whatever it is. So I say this because non-live streamers will need to keep up with live streamers who will be able to publish 5x, the 5x we're talking about, uh, compared to the content they're pushing. So all of these people who are doing insane video editing or spending you know a day editing the video that they recorded, live streamers who can do live editing will be able to publish five times what they can publish with the same amount of quality. Maybe not the same amount, but a good uh, comparison in quality. So some of you guys probably remember net neutrality. Service providers want to charge more uh, from the massive amount of content being consumed at a rate that is growing larger by the day. Uh, that's why companies use the quote-unquote unlimited plans to sell to you. The unlimited plans, let me tell you guys, are not unlimited. So they throttle after 22 gigabytes. Uh, at least for AT&T they do. And the reason why they say unlimited is because they don't expect their users to consume that much data. The reason for that is because this was sort of an old plan, right? Uh, you know, when people weren't consuming as much video uh, or as much content on the internet and there wasn't as much content, obviously they're not going to be consuming over 22 gigabytes, or at least they thought. But now as 4K gets introduced and we get live streaming and all this stuff, uh, we're using an insane amount of data, which is why net neutrality is starting to be a thing or why they're trying to pass it. Um, so computers and phones are becoming insanely more powerful as well. The average device in the near future will be able to uh, process 4K video while simultaneously ordering an Uber, uh, buying a fidget spinner on Amazon, which will be delivered by a drone. So the point is, is that we are at a point in time where the internet is advancing a lot faster than we think it is. And so is technology. So we need to be able to keep up with this stuff. And the way to do that is to start thinking about what does the future look like? If things are advancing as fast as they are right now, think about how much they're going to advance, how much faster five years from now. It's going to be insane. So here's the point. Content is getting harder and harder to optimize as saturation becomes present. Everybody's starting to learn about SEO. Everybody's starting to learn about social media marketing. They're all putting it on their resumes. But the point is, at the end of the day, content is getting harder to optimize regardless of whether or not people know SEO. As content becomes higher and higher, uh, dis dispersed more. So that being said, um, the question is, what do you think the main currency of the internet will be next to possibly cryptocurrencies and influence? So obviously Bitcoin has been a big discussion. Influence, uh, having authority is going to be very high currency on the internet. The main currency of the internet, probably next to these things and content is going to be transparency. And the reason for transparency, for that to be a thing, is that as we build higher and higher web presences, presence um, for companies and for people, and as uh, everything starts to switch to online, uh, we need to be able to be as transparent as possible. And the best way to become transparent is being able to watch somebody's life 24 hours a day. No, that's a joke, but there's not anything really much more transparent than that and what that means is live switching from publishing content only a few times a week or publishing you know a video every now and then that's pre-recorded that kind of thing to really hammering down on content and being able to control your audience with that content now what does that mean when you publish content and people see it it's one thing for them to just see it, but it's another to be able to remarket to them later with future content. Because most of these algorithms are so saturated, it, even with YouTube, if I have 16,000 subscribers, which I do, only 300 of them see my videos. 
Why is that? It's because if I publish a really okay video, it will just get okay views. If I publish a really good video, YouTube's algorithm knows how to tell and it disperses it to more people. So the point is, you actually have to start coming up with good stuff that's quality, but not just quality, but really represents what people actually want. So there's good news with that. The good news is that when people search for something, you just give them exactly what they're looking for plus a little bit more. Now, that's how the market improves because every time somebody improves the user experience a little bit, they now set a new cap that somebody else has to beat. But it has to do a lot less with links now. It has a lot more to do with how do you publish content and then control people in certain assets. Like say, for instance, I do a YouTube video. Well, then I'm going to want to bring people over to a email list or a Facebook group because then I can remarket to them a new video. But even then, most people don't open their email and most people won't see your stuff on Facebook. So it's really important to try to build as many assets as possible. So here's the real question. How can Google, YouTube, and Facebook truly understand what posts should rank or how to disperse content when there will be an insane amount of content in the near future? One way is paid advertising, which of course all these platforms have. And the other is something I call SEO triforcing, which is user intent optimization, user experience optimization, and building authority. This is an SEO course I've made. Some of you might be in it. I uh, highly recommend it if you're looking to learn about these topics. So before we get into that, let's talk about the paid advertising side of things. So back in the day, Facebook, Google, and YouTube ads were a joke. Back then, you were looking at one cent cost per click bids for things like Viagra. And it looks like the price has really sprung up with some stiff competition now. Bad joke. All jokes aside, though, now ads are so prevalent, Facebook has even recently said that they will potentially remove ads from their newsfeed. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg said that he's had it. He wants to get rid of the ads in the newsfeed because so many people are complaining about them. So why do we care? Because ads are getting so saturated on Search Console and social platforms, cold selling is becoming a lot more difficult and costly. Which means we will likely be seeing people spending their money to push out free content to their audience via remarketing or retargeting. What does that mean? It means that you're not going to be uh, able to push out content for free as much as you will be uh, right now. So this is the ultimate time to go and push out content and get free traffic, free dispersal. Uh, besides ranking in search engines and ranking with really good content, you are still able to push out moderately okay content and rank for it versus the future where unless you're really, really hammering down on your niches and spending a ton of time being an authority, understanding the user experience and then building that content based on the user intent, well, you're going to be paying for ads to disperse your free content, whether it be from the net neutrality, uh, needing to pay to get your site listed um, on certain uh, service providers or whether or not you're just going to be paying for ads on Facebook, doesn't really matter. So push your content while you can. <clears throat> so my guess is that the cost to push free content will go way up. So the average one cent CPC that we used to think was so crazy for Viagra that a lot of people would be you know, dying for right now is what is happening with free content right now. It's so cheap to push free content and people are not taking advantage of it, which is why it's so easy to make money through retargeting right now. So let's talk about SEO triforcing now. Since most of us, as, uh, as I'm assuming, are digital marketers, we'll start with Google. Um, I will show you a few pages that I was able to rank in the SEO niche with zero link building and a strong on-page SEO while utilizing correlation data. That's how I rank things, with correlation data and on-page SEO. I don't do link building. So the keyword one is white hat SEO. You can see here it's pretty competitive. It's got a 56 out of 100 score on KW Finder, which I've found is pretty accurate. and Basically, this was the formula I used. Step one, I found the search intent. Step two, created content based on the search intent. Step three, I saw how the post ranked. 
And then step four, I re-optimized the content through Search Console combined with correlation data and I ranked it. Now, what does that mean? I'm gonna break it down for you in a second, but I will let you guys know that I didn't rank for White Hat SEO initially. It took me around five months to rank without links. It was only until I re-optimized with the correlation data that I had that I ranked the post. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, we'll get into it right now. So step one, after I say this note, sorry. Uh, there is a, this is a formula I've used for and uh, tweaked for roles uh, for close to two years. Although it's very slow, I mean, sorry, although it's slow, it's very powerful. So let's run through it. So step one, find search intent. So for search intent, pretty easy. I just simply Googled the keyword I was looking to rank um, and then also SEO. I thought it'd be a good challenge if I could rank for white hat SEO with only on page since most of the people ranking for that keyword have a ton of links. So I just simply typed in, uh, you know, white hat SEO techniques. I'm like, oh, I want to go for that. And then eventually maybe I'll go for white hat SEO. So I used my brain, very important, to figure out under and understand what the intent was by looking at the commonalities in each of these high ranking pages. So I found that a lot of these pages were tip based posts. So we look at what's ranking on Google right now, we can see we have white hat SEO, how to rank without breaking the rules, seven white hat SEO techniques, what is white hat SEO, uh, guide to white hat SEO. So it was all guides, it was all sort of tip based things or, or how did, you know, what is white hat. So I found those commonalities and I started optimizing for them. So two, create content based on that search intent. So once I found that, uh, you know, a lot of it was around tips, I created content for the tip based post with streamlined outreach using Pitchbox. So I was able to automate my outreach to other people who know about this subject and ask them for their tip about this subject in an automated way. So an uh, important technique I used for this step is to make sure I pixel my pages, by the way, guys. Anytime I'm sending traffic to a website, as I said before, I want to make sure that I am remarketing to them with YouTube ads and Facebook ads. So if you don't know about how to set up remarketing tags in Google or Facebook pixels, I highly recommend you go out and learn how to do that. So number three, I saw how the post ranked. Because I targeted long tail keywords within the initial post, I wound up ranking for less competitive version of White Hat SEO, which was White Hat SEO techniques, which I'm still ranking for, as you can see over here. And step four, I re-optimized the content through Search Console and combined with correlation data, and I ranked the site. So uh, this part that I'm talking about right here, step four, is a little bit trickier, but some basic principles can be applied here. So the way Google ranks posts and pages and anything and how most uh, search engines rank things these days is based on what else is ranking. So what does that mean? It means that if I'm trying to rank for white hat SEO, Google is looking for certain data around that. It could be you know social signals, it could be links, it could be uh, authority, it could be uh, content length, it could be a bunch of stuff. But the point is is that I actually went on Google and looked and saw what these different factors could be by, by looking at the different posts that we're currently ranking. So that's not to say that correlation data can't change. So uh, for instance, people now uh, in the SEO niche usually refer to long form content as the skyscraper technique, meaning that that intent to find long form content and to optimize for that actually changed to a new keyword called the skyscraper technique. And the way you change that is by either becoming an influencer or having something change in perception based on your audience. So some great ways to find correlation data if you don't want to use your, uh, you know, your own eyeballs um, is to use something called Quora, which is a software which lets you actually go and pretty much see all of the most commonalities on Google uh, between different sites. Like for instance, you know, the word counts, the heading tags, the most common tag, uh, you know, uh, keywords used, that kind of thing. Step five, number five is to rank. And with the help of Quora, I was able to rank for competitive keywords like White Hat SEO um, and beginner phishing tips. So I was actually able to rank for beginner phishing tips on Google as well. Uh, but that was actually out Quora. It was the same sort of method, and this was before I ever heard about Quora and before Quora was even out, I think. So you don't have to have expensive tools to do this. Um, sometimes they help, though. And I would say they give you a, a sometimes a 5 to 10% boost in what you're doing. So let's take uh, some other algorithms like YouTube now. 
YouTube's primary ranking factor, as just explained before, is average view duration, view retention rate, click-through rates, that kind of thing. So other primary factors include, uh, you know, click-through rates, as I was saying, likes, subscribes, etc., and having your viewers stay on your channel after watching uh, the first video and then watching multiple videos more. So unfortunately for people like me, YouTube has made a recent algorithm change where having subscribers doesn't really matter anymore, as I said. And now, in order for people to actually get notified, they have to click on this little bell icon. So that means if your content sucks, it'll probably won't rank and it will also won't get you a ton of views even if you have a ton of subscribers. So you can see this guy has 658,000 subscribers and on average his videos get around 5 to 10,000 views. That is a not a large percentage of the amount of subscribers he has. So, also because the internet is indeed multiplying in content as we speak, it's getting harder and harder to get content seen. So how do we keep engagement and retention rates high in niches that are becoming extremely saturated besides ads uh, and besides user experience optimization and user intent optimization? So step one, we start figuring out how to make live streams awesome and push out content at a 5x rate. It doesn't have to be video. It could be uh, you know, tip-based post. It could be anything. But the point is, is that we really start diving more and more into content marketing and less into uh, creating content just for the purpose of creating content, but actually creating unique assets that people actually want. Two, we go for trends, not just keywords. And Google Trends is one of the best tools I've ever seen for creating content. If you guys have never seen it, it's fa uh, fabulous. You can really t find a lot of correlation data between what's trending and what to actually publish content around as well. Uh, the way I do is I just go there and I go to Sci Tech Niche and then I just find things that are trending around 2018 and or around the last 24 hours and then I'll correlate it back to my main subject somehow or I target more top of the funnel type people and then funnel them into my main stuff. So let's talk about Facebook now. First of all, Facebook's new feed, news feed is almost complete garbage, uh, which brings us to Facebook pages and groups. <laughs> uh, Facebook pages and groups are pretty much where most people hang out these days. Um, so this would be a question. How many of you use Facebook groups? Raise your hand. Unfortunately, we're not in a physical presence right now, so you can't raise your hand. But I'm assuming most of you use Facebook groups. Facebook groups are unfortunately not what they used to be either. Uh, they are very similar to YouTube's engagement-based ranking system. Uh, here's an engagement test I actually ran when I gave away a free audit template. This video or this template that I gave away wound up going viral and getting me banned from Facebook because I pretty much exploited something in Facebook, which you can to still totally do. So what I did is I said, hey, here's a free something. All you have to do is give me a hashtag, give me roadmap, and I'll send it to you via message. So I posted this like in five different groups, and then within the first two hours, I had over, uh, what was it, a couple thousand comments. But I got banned. And it was because... I responded to everybody's comment that commented on this post. Now, when I responded to everybody who was commenting, it kept showing it to more people because they were all engaging with it and I was engaging with them. So every time I commented, it just kept making more and more engagement on that post. And then within literally two hours of me doing comments, I was getting thousands of comments overall because it was just dispersing, dispersing it to everybody. So uh, the point about this is uh, these different algorithms, uh, wait, sorry. The whole point of this, of showing you these different algorithms and how they work is that they are all gearing up at being monsters at understanding user experience data so that ranking things will be so, uh, a lot easier. Stone age algorithms such as link, uh, link building or links will be extremely insignificant in the future from what I can see. So let's talk about what the black hat community has been up to lately. Most of the black hats end up understanding what's trending and where the uh, SEO is headed and they start manipulating it, though good ones at least, before a lot of other people uh, or before search engines are really good at you know, combating this. So what black hats do is they do user experience manipulation. And the way they do that is they hire real people to click into keywords, engage with posts, uh, you know, watch YouTube videos, all that kind of stuff because they know that that's going to be able to rank these pages. Now, some of them claim that this is going to rank your pages and posts forever, but I highly doubt that mainly because uh, if you have a 1% click-through rate 
three months after you've been used to having a 20% click-through rate, Google's likely going to uh, start ranking you lower. And just to give you guys a spoiler alert, most black hat strategies don't work for substantially long amounts of time. So there's good news and bad news with these uh, black hat strategies. The good news is that black hats are confirming what I'm saying as they are able to achieve short-term success by explo uh, exploiting user engagement signals. The bad news is that when you forget about the end goal of what you're doing by manipulating fake signals is you may never actually get good at understanding your market and understanding or mastering how to formulate, sell, and innovate in the market that uh, to your maximum potential. Because at the end of the day, the only thing we really care about is being able to optimize and understand uh, our market as well as possible. So if you could care less about those things and you just want to make money, then go for the black hat uh, new tactics that are coming out. You will probably be able to learn uh, earn short-term money. And if that's for you, go ahead. I don't do that. So to sum things up, here's what I recommend if you aren't doing these things already. Step one, start streaming as soon as possible um, and learn live video editing. I'm telling you this is where the future is, guys. You'll likely suck when you first start and nobody will listen. <laughs> uh, it took me almost a year before I uh, got over one to 2,000 views per video in the first month, but uh, that's in the SEO niche, which is a very small market. So um, in most other niches, you can start live streaming spend a, a good amount of time creating content. And uh, if it's a very general niche, uh, you could generally start pulling a decent amount of views pretty quickly. Uh, number two, look at correlation data with what you're trying to drive traffic to. So if there's strong signals of the two metrics, stop and move to the next idea. Uh, so oversaturation or extremely high user experience metrics needed. That means if you're trying to go for something like weight loss, and it's on Google and you know that it's oversaturated and you need really high UX or high correlation data like freaking a thousand links because links still are a ranking factor, I would try to move on to something else. So this is not the case if you're a huge influencer in your niche because it's a lot easier to publish your content and disperse it and rank for it. Uh, number three, do user trend analysis with your keyword research. Understand intent and create mirrored UX to match what people are actually looking for. Number four, repurpose the hell out of your content from video to text preferably. So uh, what I'm actually be doing with this post is publishing it into a blog post so that people can read it afterwards. Um, in the future, I may repurpose this again into something else. Who knows? Um, there's actually been some slides from another presentation I did in this presentation to convey points. Number five, create multiple assets that you can control for a cross promotion in order to generate high UX signals to new posts. So make sure you start siphoning people from a video to a Facebook group, from a Facebook group to an email, whatever it is. Number six, never give up on your dream. That's obvious. And that's it. So uh, thank you guys for your time. If you have any questions, uh, now is the time to ask.